Should we be getting vaccinated again? What protection does another booster vaccination offer against new variants? Welcome to the latest edition of our COVID-19 special. Also on the programme, in Spain, medical experts are concerned that if not enough people get vaccinated worldwide, the greater the risk that new variants will emerge. But first, to Germany. What side effects can COVID vaccinations cause? And where can those affected find help? Hello. Hello. Hello, Hello, Doctor. How are you? Oh, pretty good so far, if it weren't for my ailments. My lymph nodes under my armpits are always swollen in the evening, which is new. And I've got fluid retention in my legs, but I've had that for a while. Twice a week, Mark Geldmacher goes for oxygen therapy. The 45-year-old from Bielefeld is seriously ill. Since his second corona vaccination in June last year, he's developed a range of symptoms, some of them life-threatening. The so-called post-vaccine syndrome is a newly identified multifaceted condition for which there are no studies or treatment guidelines in Germany. The treatment here is Mark's own personal attempt to ease his suffering. It won't cure him, but it promises to improve his resilience and ability to recuperate. The impact on Mr. Geldmacher is huge, but it's not as easy to diagnose as known diseases. We're not experts in epidemiology. At first, we had to learn how to handle the pandemic, find the right measures, discover what's appropriate and what's not. And it's the same again now. Mark Geldmacher's condition makes it hard for him to climb stairs. He used to be passionate about sports, and played soccer at a local club, went running and did mountain bike tours until his symptoms made it impossible. That was really a great tour. The weather was super, it was really fun. You can see how happy I looked. In my condition now, I can't do any of that. And I don't even know if it will be possible again. I'm just hoping for the best. That Mark Geldmacher's condition has been caused by the vaccination has been medically attested to, and his long list of ailments speaks for itself. His blood vessels are damaged, so is his heart. He's in severe pain, has concentration and circulation problems. The list goes on and on. He's been on sick leave since October last year. Thomas, hi, I'm good. Hey, good. Yeah, alles prima. Daniel, you Schön dich zu sehen. Mark receives a lot of support, both in his private life as well as from work colleagues. His friends are shocked by what has happened to him. The pep is missing, the drive is missing, he's not out going anymore. When we invite him for a drink after practice, to have a beer or even a soda, he doesn't want to. He just doesn't have the energy anymore. Until 14 or 15 months ago, he was still always active. I'm so sorry that something like this has happened to him. We want you back to how you were before, to how we loved and valued you. It's really good that I have the guys, that I can have a chat about things and get support, because otherwise I'd be very, very alone with my problems. There are currently only a few places in Germany where patients can turn to for help, like at the University Hospital in Marburg. Cardiologist Bernhard Schiefer is one of the leading physicians treating this condition. The complexity of the symptoms is actually similar to that found in long COVID patients. That is, the symptomatology changes over time. That makes it difficult to establish a diagnosis. We treat the associated infections. We put them on a histamine-free diet to boost the immune system. 
actually the microbiome at the center of the immune system. And we treat comorbidities, like blood pressure and diabetes, and all the things that were unknown in each patient up to that point. The fundamental lack of information means doctors often research COVID-related symptoms for themselves and develop their own methods for treatment. This is exactly what anne katrin Brüggemann did. Together with a colleague from Berlin and other doctors from German-speaking countries, she has put together a medical handbook. We are a large group of physicians and scientists from other fields who have ideas about this problem. And we've brought those ideas together in one document where we also made sure, however, that we could give as much evidence as possible for everything that we wrote in there, so that it's easy for everyone who reads it to understand how we came up with the ideas, and that the treatment we suggest is evidence-based. Brüggemann speaks from experience. She's also living with post-vaccine syndrome. The 46-year-old has been unable to work since last fall. She suffered from severe exhaustion for weeks and could hardly get out of bed. In the beginning, she found it hard to manage her symptoms, but now she's feeling better. Would she get the COVID vaccine again? If I could see that there was now a development in dealing with the problem after the vaccination, I could imagine getting vaccinated again. But right now, to be honest, because I haven't really had any help, except of course the fantastic help of my family doctor and my allergist, I would steer clear of it at the moment. The Paul Ehrlich Institute is responsible for the safety of vaccines in Germany. It recently announced it was conducting a study on vaccine side effects, together with the Hanover Medical School. It's an important step for post-vaccination sufferers like Marc Geldmacher and anne katrin Brüggemann, who hope that researchers might discover the cause of their problem so that they and others can finally get help. Over 180 million vaccine doses have been administered in Germany. How many recipients have suffered from complications? The Paul Ehrlich Institute, mentioned in the previous report, is responsible for monitoring the safety of vaccines in Germany. Our reporter, Stefanie Zobel, talked to its president, Klaus Sihutek, to find out more. How does the Paul Ehrlich Institute respond to reports of suspected cases of side effects? We handle all reports of suspected cases of vaccine side effects or complications in the same way. The data is anonymized and evaluated. The suspected cases are reported by doctors, the drug commission, vaccine manufacturers and affected people. Firstly, we check if these are identifiable cases of rare or very rare side effects, or whether it's a coincidence that the reactions have taken place after getting a particular vaccine. And to reduce the risks, and this is the aim of this exercise, we take measures or have measures taken to reduce the risks. How many suspected cases have been reported to you? Hundreds of thousands relating to various vaccines. But fundamentally, I can say that we are lucky that the COVID vaccines that have been approved for use in Germany, in Europe, are very safe. That means that we have fewer than 10 recognized cases of severe side effects per 100,000 vaccinations. That's a very good ratio. And we know on the basis of the many vaccinations that have now taken place globally, not just in Germany or Europe, that we have a very good overview of even the most minor side effects linked to certain vaccines. And we have acted very quickly, either with the Paul Ehrlich Institute itself or in conjunction with the Standing Committee on Vaccination or the European Medicines Agency to take measures to further reduce the risks.
Sie sich auf diese Zahl jetzt schon Can you already put a figure on it, when so many suspected cases have already been reported, and when more may be reported and require investigation? For many of these vaccinations, up to billions of vaccinations have already taken place globally. They have also now been taking place over a considerable length of time, over years, and we have learned an awful lot about the vaccines, and even about very rare side effects, which purely statistically cannot be collected even in very big clinical trials. So we can specify a clear rate of certain side effects being reported. And they're explained and described in detail in our periodic safety reports under www.pei.de. What are the typical side effects reported to you? To sum it up, the typical severe side effects identified up to now are myocarditis and pericarditis in the case of young men under 30 after mRNA vaccinations. In the case of the adenovirus vectored vaccines, we have seen sinovenous thrombosis and thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, and you can react to these accordingly. Then there are very minimal reactions which are all recorded in the Paul Ehrlich Institute safety report. Klaus Shishotek, President of the Paul Ehrlich Institute, thank you. Thank you. Do you have questions about COVID-19? Our science correspondent Derek Williams is up to date with the latest research and analysis. Just send your questions to covidproducer at dw.com. This week, he answers a question from Kim. If new variants are evading immunity, how does getting another booster help? With different healthcare authorities all over the world making a range of different recommendations, the whole question of, of who should get a second booster and which one they should get and, and when they should get it, that's really sowed a lot of confusion. So let's just look at some of the questions and, and the answers and the speculation. Um, first, it's clear that getting a booster shot doesn't act as an ironclad barrier that prevents you from getting the disease completely. In most of us, though, it does seem to act as a pretty good deterrent for at least a while by pumping up antibody numbers. Um, but that effect doesn't last forever. I've talked to an awful lot of people who thought that they were up to date on their shots, but then came down with COVID-19 anyway. But on the bright side, evidence from studies shows that when they do get the disease, boosted people are less likely to have a severe case, even if they got the booster shot many months ago. Um, that indicates that at least some of the long-term effects that original vaccines have on the immune system, that they seem to be holding up pretty well. Um, in other words, Vaccinated and boosted people are getting sick because their immune response isn't really synced to the newer, fast spreading Omicron subvariants that now dominate the COVID landscape. But um, as a rule, they aren't getting really sick because their immune system reacts faster than if it had to learn about the pathogen from scratch. So that's certainly an argument for getting at least the first booster. But expert opinion is still pretty divided on whether a second booster shot makes sense for everyone, at least. Um, it's a question that's complicated by the fact that so many people have been infected this year as Omicron subvariants swept across the globe. And, and what makes things more complicated still is the issue of what are called um, bivalent shots, which are slated to arrive in some places this fall. Um, they include a component that specifically targets those Omicron subvariants. So many people are choosing to wait for them. Um, but because we still don't really have any wide scale data on how well those tweaked vaccines will actually work, um, healthcare authorities in many places are trying to strike what seems to me to be a safe balance. Um, 
they recommend a second booster with current vaccines for seniors and vulnerable groups if it's been several months since the first booster. Because um, especially for those people, every extra bit of immune protection helps, uh, particularly with winter looming in the Northern Hemisphere. Another campaign to get people vaccinated is starting in Spain this fall. Around half of all Spaniards have already received their first booster shot. Vaccination rates are high in the country. 85% of people have been vaccinated at least twice. With one of Europe's highest vaccination rates, Spain eased its COVID-19 restrictions last March. Those who tested positive no longer had to self-isolate. Masks became mandatory only in healthcare settings and on public transport. Only the over 60s, the immunocompromised, pregnant women and health workers are monitored. After two years, people in Spain return to everyday life. Some welcome that. Personally, I'm happy that the situation has been normalized because this disease is going to be staying with us for life. Of course, we have to be careful, but it's time for us to return to our daily lives. It's time to treat COVID like another flu. Others remain more cautious. I think we are all aware that the disease is there, that it hasn't gone away completely. So we have to be careful when we mix with others. The relaxation of restrictions in Spain took place when the less aggressive BA2 Omicron subvariant was predominant. This didn't put pressure on the health system, but was it too soon? It was risky in a way. Nobody in Europe had done it. But with hindsight, if we look at the data now, we see acceptable results in terms of hospitalization rates, in severe cases in intensive care units, and there was no increase in the fatality rate. However, in June, the new Omicron subvariants BA4 and BA5, more transmissible than the previous ones, unleashed another wave of infections. The new subvariants are immune to the antibodies produced by natural infection or vaccination, so people who have already been infected can be reinfected. As a result, the number of COVID cases increased, and more than 11,000 people were hospitalized at the beginning of July. The relaxation of measures, together with the emergence of new subvariants, has made it easier for the virus to spread again. There's been a spike of cases among the general population and in the healthcare sector. And that's put a strain on the health system. Fortunately, it's held up quite well. Spain is currently undergoing its eighth COVID wave, but incidence in the over 60s has now dropped to 400 cases per 100,000 people, the same rate as before the lifting of restrictions. Hospitalizations have also significantly decreased. The Spanish government has announced that the fourth vaccination campaign will start in autumn. However, the new vaccines have to be adapted to the latest variants of the virus. Experts are also warning that the global vaccination rate will play an important role in how the pandemic develops and that a close eye should be kept on new mutations. The future of the COVID-19 pandemic will also depend very much on the overall development in the world, in the sense that the entire world population has to be vaccinated. If the virus continues to reproduce in other parts of the world, there will always be the possibility of variants that escape the immunity that's been generated. It is the virus that dictates the route we have to take and how we have to react. If the virus becomes more infectious again, we may have to resort to more drastic measures, limiting free movement, setting capacity limits or curfews. Experts say the situation in Spain is under control for now, and that prevention remains the best weapon to combat the unpredictable virus. Thank you. 
And now our science update, the COVID studies making headlines. So you had COVID-19 and have felt fatigued or short of breath ever since? For weeks, maybe even months? It's probably already occurred to you that those are classic signs of long COVID. But maybe you noticed other symptoms as well, like that you're losing a lot of hair or that your sex life is suffering. According to this study, those can also be symptoms of long COVID and they occur a lot more often than you might think. For their study, the researchers mined a huge British database. They compared information provided by around half a million people who tested positive for COVID-19 but weren't hospitalized with data from close to 2 million people who had no prior indications of infection. The study's two big goals were A, to determine the most common long COVID symptoms and B, to pin down who is most in danger of ending up a long hauler. The researchers identified a total of 62 symptoms that were linked to an infection with SARS-CoV-2. Among them, ones that regularly occurred in some patients even 12 weeks later. This long list includes a couple of symptoms that grab your attention. Things like reported hair loss, difficulty ejaculating and reduced libido. The researchers also looked at who was most at risk of having one or more of the listed symptoms 12 weeks or longer after the initial infection. The results showed that women are affected more often than men and that all factors considered younger people appear to be more likely to develop long COVID than elderly patients. Socioeconomic status also had an impact, as did, of course, the patient's health before the infection. The study has helped clarify the confusion surrounding the wide range of long-term symptoms reported by people who suffer from long COVID. That in turn can help medical professionals diagnose the condition with more confidence. And in the long run, hopefully, develop better treatments for coping with its many different debilitating effects. Doctors worldwide are still working out how best to treat the symptoms of long COVID. In Taiwan, people are increasingly turning to traditional Chinese medicine. When the symptoms of a COVID infection won't go away, herbal preparations can help. Huang Wei contracted COVID-19 one month ago, and he still has difficulty breathing. I recovered from the initial illness after about seven days. But now when I ride my bike, it's hard to breathe and I can barely get going. Huang is still suffering from the after effects of the infection. He had to change his lifestyle to help cope with the symptoms. For me, modern medicine is more for urgent treatments, like for eye disease or a cut. I take Chinese medicine for chronic illnesses and to relieve my symptoms. One of Huang's main symptoms was a fever, and he helped himself using traditional Chinese medicine. The traditional herbal remedy called Taiwan Qingguan Yihao was developed by the National Research Institute. It was approved by the authorities in April, when Taiwan was confronted with a new wave of infections. Taiwan has been doing research into the effect of Chinese medicine on coronaviruses for a long time. Now it's also doing clinical research. It was found that Chinese medicine can be effective, and this attracted worldwide interest. You can already find a lot of articles about Chinese medicine in prestigious journals like the New England Journal of Medicine or The Lancet. Patients in Taiwan need a prescription from a doctor of Chinese medicine to get Qingwan Yihao, and the cost is covered by state health insurance. Chen Xu Si, a local epidemiologist, sees the integration of Western and traditional Chinese medicine as a positive development. I think this time the complementary alternative medicines help so much. In particular, they can relieve symptoms and they can boost the immunizations. So during the treatment, actually, from Taiwan experience, uh, they already uh, become our national guideline to help the people 
uh, facility the recovery uh, in combination with the uh, antivirus therapies uh, from the Osotos medicine. More than 60% of Taiwanese people believe that traditional Chinese medicine helps to boost immunity and reduces the likelihood of contracting COVID-19, according to one survey. However, herbal medicine has only been used in Taiwan for mild COVID-19 symptoms and doctors continue to use modern medicine to treat severe cases. Huang Wei appreciates the ways traditional Chinese medicine has helped to alleviate his symptoms. The pandemic, he says, has fundamentally changed his mind about traditional therapies. That's all for this week. Thanks for tuning in and see you next time.